Hi, everybody. Um, welcome and a rather belated Happy New Year to you now. Time goes so quickly, doesn't it? But a really warm welcome here to the UCL Institute of Education. And thanks so much for joining us this evening. We're really delighted to be once again hosting the Varkey Foundation's Global, Global Teacher Prize Lecture. And this year, we're particularly pleased as the prize winner also happens to be an alumna of the IOE, twice over, because Andrea studied on the IOE's Art and Design PGCE program, and she's also a graduate of the CoLab National Professional Qualifications Senior Leadership Program, which is also run in partnership with the IOE. So we're really pleased to welcome Andrea back to the IOE, as well as to host her lecture here. And of course, it's now a double celebration because Andrea was awarded an MBE for her services to education and young people in the New Year's Honours list. So many congratulations, Andrea. Now, back in March 2018, I attended the Global Education and Skills Forum in Dubai, where the Global Teacher Prize winner was announced. And the IOE partners with the Varkey Foundation on that event. And again, I would like to congratulate the Varkey Foundation on the Global Teacher Prize, because it's, it just adds a very much needed out and out celebration of teachers and the work they do and I think that's so important but of course as befits the Global Teacher Prize Andrea Zafraku's work at Alperton Community School in Brent really is inspirational Andrea spent the entirety of her teaching career which is 12 years and counting 13 years and counting, we are in the new year after all, at Alperton. And she was promoted to Deputy Head of Art within a year of her arrival. And she's now Associate Deputy Head Teacher, leading on profession, staff professional development. She's continued to spearhead through this time the focus on inclusion and engagement at Alperton. She's led the redesign of the school's curriculum to have it better resonate with pupils there. She continually celebrates pupils' cultural heritage and bear in mind that there are about 130 different languages sp spoken in Brent. She enables all pupils to access sport and well-being provision at the school, and she also works with the local community on keeping pupils safe in an outside school as well. But it's Andrea's work as an arts and textiles teacher and in arts education that is, of course, our focus for this evening. We've heard a lot about the impact of funding cuts and policies like the introduction of the English Baccalaureate on pupils' access to a broad curriculum, and in particular, the impact on arts education. And IOE colleagues, along with teachers and leading artists, have been among the voices making the case for the importance of arts education for all. Added to those voices, we now have Andrea's charity, Art, Artists in Residence, a characteristically proactive and practical response from Andrea to the issues at hand. Artists in Residence is arranging for artists, musicians, actors, filmmakers and dancers to visit schools that otherwise would find it challenging to offer arts education. Before we hear from Andrea on these themes and why you cannot be truly educated without the arts, please can I invite Vegeta Patel, who's principal of Swiss Cottage School Development and Research Centre and a trustee of the Varkey Foundation, to say a few words. Vegeta. Thank you, Becky, and thank you to UCL IOE for hosting this very important lecture. The Varkey Foundation has a clear mission, 
to boost the status and capacity of teachers. The foundation works in a myriad of ways to make our contribution to this global effort. We support innovation in the classroom and teaching profession through partnerships with other organizations who share our mission and share our goal. The work we engage with aims to build the capacity of teachers and school leaders. Our programs in Ghana have now reached over 5,000 teachers in over 500 schools, strengthening the focus on girls' education and improving teaching practice. In Uganda, our Cascading Leadership Program has impacted almost 28,000 teachers. That is 12% of the primary teaching workforce. In Argentina, our Leadership Program has trained almost 2,000 school leaders. And we are very keen to facilitate a global conversation about what matters in education to positively change the way that teachers are treated and supported by policymakers. Our founder, Sonny Varkey, is passionate about celebrating the transformative impact that teachers have on their students' lives and communities. At the heart of this is the Global Teacher Prize. Every year, the top 50 finalists of the Global Teacher Prize join our community of Varkey teacher ambassadors. Last year, the community grew to 200 teachers from over 60 countries, working together as global advocates for the profession. The Global Teacher Prize is presented annually to an exceptional teacher who has made an outstanding contribution to the profession. In 2018, there were 30,000 applications and nominations from 173 countries. It is an absolute pleasure to introduce to you the Global Teacher Prize winner for 2018, Andrea Zafaraku, the very first winner for England, who has just received, as Becky mentioned, an MBE in the New Year Honours. Everyone. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Thank you. You're here. It's such a delightful moment for me to be um, to be home, to be where it all began for me at this amazing building on the eighth floor uh, with Leslie next door. I was taught by Nick um, Addison and. Um, uh, it was the most wonderful experience of my life, really, being here on this PGC course with the colleagues there. And I still have um, the most amazing friends that I could ever wish for who attended with me on those courses. And I'm just so proud to be here. So thank you very much for coming and hearing about my story, about my journey and what my passions are, which I'm sure you can imagine is all about the arts in education. So... March the 18th, 2018, um, this is what happened to me. I was fortunate enough to win um, and be awarded an award which I can't even begin to explain what it means. Sunny Varkin and Varkin Foundation believe that teachers have got the power to transform lives. And I was, first of all, blessed <laughs> to have been nominated in the first top 50 alongside some other incredible, exceptional colleagues that are in this room. Eartha, there you are at the back. But also to be up amongst these, the top 10 here. Now, these people, they are, they're phenomenal. We have got teachers who are changing lives in um, countries by um, accessing maths on a global scale. We've got teachers who work in robotics. We've got head teachers there who are, who are fighting with gangs. And then you've got me, an art teacher in London, Brent. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> who won this? And I'm still pinching myself because um, it still takes me a lot of convincing to understand why I'm here in front of you and what it means to be here in front of you and why I think the ambassadors there, the judges, were so gracious enough to see something that they thought was the right person, the right moment for this year. So this is me and my world. This is my wonderful um, school and my students that I teach. I teach secondary school, which is years 11 to 18, and I'm an art and textiles teacher there. We are literally about 45, if not half an hour, minutes up the road in Alperton, Brent. And um, as Becky said, it's the most diverse place you can ever imagine in London. Um, 
in my school, we speak um, over, or we have children who represent um, 85, I think the, the last census was 85, but 85 different languages. Um, with diversity, we have got challenges and we have got some families of ours who um, suffer poverty, but that doesn't matter to us because our children achieve and we make sure that happens by putting in systems, by putting in infrastructures, by putting in um, opportunities for them to grow and to have everything which they need to thrive. We are a school that believes in inclusion and um, pastoral care being the number one priority. And it works. And here's just some images of what our classrooms is, uh, are like. Um, I'm really fortunate enough, and I'm, maybe it's because um, <laughs> I don't take no for an answer, but the arts in my school are quite are very strong. Um, we have, in terms of GCSE, over 100 students taking art every single year. And this goes to show how much they love the subject, how much they benefit from the subject, and why it's important to them. And considering that our community... Um, would prefer their children to possibly become a doctor, an architect, our students are still taking up their subjects because they believe that these subjects have got the skills which they need to help them with not just the arts, but all subjects. But for me, the most important message that the arts can bring is that they are inclusive. There are no ceilings for students who take the arts. They have no labels. Colour is not an issue. Whether or not they have a special educational need, that's not an issue there because they can achieve and they will achieve. And um, as ever, I'm going to ask you, being a teacher, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. So we have got on the screen two pieces of work from my students. Um, these are GCSE pieces of work, uh, a year old. Um, the one on this side of the room... Um, is a self-portrait of, of a young person. And on the other side of the room, we have got a very, another very different self-portrait of a, of a young person who tried to connect or tried to express their emotions. I have a question for you. Which one of these students do you think experience or have special educational needs? Do you believe, or hands up if you think it's a student on this side of the room? Excellent. Don't be shy, don't be shy. Stretch up those arms. Fantastic, excellent. And what about on the other side? Okay, lovely. Some people have got the same hands up. Good. And you're right, because they both do. They both do. And they have both achieved the top marks you can get in the arts. And this is the only subject which that has been possible for them. And why is that? Because they are given the opportunities to explore different materials, materials which they feel comfortable in accessing. They're given the time. They're given the, the facilities, the resources, and the support. And as a result of that, they feel comfortable and confident enough to achieve. And I think it's this young person's work which really blew me away. And I've had the pleasure of meeting this young person. I'm going to call him John, if that's okay. So John came to us when he was in year, um, when he was in the end of year nine, beginning of year ten, and he came from a special school very near us. He couldn't speak. He was selected mute. Was very intimidated, very shy. Um, and I and I wasn't very sure if if he was going to be able to make it. He had a very reduced timetable. Um, like many of our students, we try and have a bespoke timetable for them. And one day he came in and he produced, or he, he took out of his bag a, a scrap piece of paper and he left it on the table. And I was walking around the room, I managed to just peek over and push his books aside and see the work that was there. And it was the most extraordinary drawing of, of a guitar you'd ever seen. The tone was amazing, beautifully applied. Um, the outline was was perfect the shape was there um, and he added lots of information on that and I said to him did, did you do this John and then he just didn't say anything and I was like okay all right I, I there, there's something here John against all the odds managed to get a C for his GCSE art but not only that he's now or he's now completed his A-level in art photography 
He got an A. He's completed this year his art and design A-level in art, and he got an A. He wants to go to Bournemouth University to study gaming, and he will go there. And honestly, it's just been the most extraordinary journey and privilege watching students like John benefit, heal, and feel that they are the same within the world of the arts. But not only, not only that, um, I feel that for our students, the arts helps to push stereotypes. It pushes their boundaries. And some of our students are able to really identify who they are, who, what, what stories they want to tell us. And here we have a, a young student who was, had some very, very conflicting situations at home. Um, Self-harm, wasn't sure whether or not um, she could return home every day. And yet through the power of the arts and through that battle, that journey, that perseverance, the fact that she didn't want to, she wanted to portray who she thought she was and tell her stories, to be able to communicate her feelings, the things that hurt her. This is, this is for me the most powerful result that any child can have. And if you think about it, our students who are taking GCSEs, they're undertaking approximately 20 examinations in the space of three weeks. If they don't have subjects, for example, music and drama and arts, that can help them to relax, that can help them to just take time and be completely absorbed in what they want to do, then I'm very worried for the mental health of our students. And thankfully, we have got incredible practitioners in our art classrooms, in our schools, who are able to guide our students and help them through their struggles. Now, this is a recent piece of work from one of my students. Um, she was, we will call her Fazana. Fazana um, was a refugee from Syria, and this was her most recent examination piece for her GCSE artwork. When I saw her making this, I, I was quite tearful because I, I knew, I was the only few members of staff who knew about her journey. She had to flee in the middle of the night and she fled under um, the support of the British Army to be able to move to the UK. And she did that leaving back her mum, her dad, um, and her two brothers and sisters. She's obviously by herself in this country and she's living with um, an auntie figure. And... When I asked her what this piece of work was, um, she, we, we managed to communicate, and the, but the thing that she said to me was, Miss, it's about peace, and we can see that through the dove. But what was quite fascinating was that she had um, a speech mark in the top um, right-hand corner there, and I was waiting and waiting to find out what she was going to add in that speech mark, what kind of words, what was it she was trying to communicate across to us. And I'm wondering if anyone in this room would like to share or what, what thoughts you have of what the student there was, would have, could have placed in those words. Help, thank you. Anyone else? Peace. Interesting, what will become of me? At the back, gentlemen, sorry. Uh, hope. hope, excellent. Okay, you're on the right track. Um, her answer to me was, but Miss, who will listen from me? Who will listen? And I thought that was probably the most powerful thing I've heard all year. But through this art piece of artwork, we can feel that we know exactly what her journey is, what she's asking for. She's asking for hope. She's asking for love. She's asking for stop this thing from happening. But not only that, the arts also help our students to voice their opinions of society. Um, in terms of uh, our textiles course, we make sure that we really promote um, the, the fact that we need to be, have a sustainable environment, that we need to protect our environment. And again, the arts are, are the areas where our children can really feel that they have and can support the ethical 
situations and also humanity itself. So, did I tell you that I won a million dollars, by the way? Uh, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, it's, just, it's totally mind-blowing. But um, in March, not only did I award, was I awarded this tremendous award here, the Global Teacher Prize, but um, Sally Varkey decided that every teacher should have a million dollars, which is wonderful. Um, slightly bonkers, but wonderful. What I feel is that... What I feel is at the moment, the arts in this country are not being given what they deserve, especially in our schools. What we need to do is make sure that every child has got the access to the arts. And if you're looking at the economy, the arts and the creative industries produce 92 billion to our economies. And yet, not all of our students and not all of our schools are experiencing this. Why is that? So um, what I decided to do, instead of... Um, going home and enjoying a fantastic holiday with my family, I decided to put my money where my mouth was, and I am changing the world. I'm helping schools through this charity, Artists in Residence, to connect schools with artists, because I believe in the power of the role model. I believe that our children, once they work with artists, once they see exactly what they can do, that their opinions and their options are not going to be limited, that they will be inspired They'll be motivated. And not only that, they hopefully might be able to take up the arts. Because not all our schools have the facilities and the resources to do this, to offer this. And if I can help, and if my charity can help, then I'm delighted to be able to help schools achieve this. And we had a fantastic launch. And the thing about the arts world is the size of their heart. They, I've never experienced it in my entire life. The whole world, the whole arts world was behind me. And many of them are in this room here today and it's lovely to see you all. But I, and because of that, I felt empowered and I felt that we can do this and we will do this. And as a result of that, many of our artists have um, signed up and it's with great privilege and my absolute honor to invite a dear, dear friend of mine, um, Mike Attenborough, who has, was, it's just completely inspired me. And he was the one who says, I'm here to help. What is it you need? Tell me what you want me to do and I will do it. And there's not that many people around there who can do that. But from what I've seen through the arts, people understand what I'm trying to say. And that is that we need help. And thankfully, um, Mike was there and he's here tonight to help me um, tell you what it means to be an artist in one of our schools and what he thinks is the importance of arts and education. Mike, would you, would you mind, please, coming up? Thank you very much. You can see me, but I'm a very short person, but I'm very encouraged by the fact that I could see Andrea as well, so um, all is well. Um, I am actually going to be very partial and rather opinionated uh, tonight about the arts in education uh, because I have very strong views about it. I've worked in the arts all my professional life. I'm 69 next month and have worked as a theatre director for 47 years. And I have a very, um, if you like, evangelical view of it. In fact, I would like to start with a fairly punchy statement, which is I actually think that the, the self-expression, the right to self-expression for a child is a basic human right. It's as basic as the freedom of speech. It's trickier than the freedom of speech because actually it's not automatically assumed by everybody in the world, particularly young people, that they have the right or the ability to do that. So they need help. They need the help of the people in this room. And I know that I'm acutely aware that I'm standing in a room with, with people who are infinitely more qualified than me um, to help children. But it does seem to me that that is an absolutely non-negotiable human right. And I think if you abuse that human right, you end up with a really horrible 
pollutant in the minds of young children, and I want to expand and explain why. The arts, after all, are our connection to the world, are they not? They unite our sense of play and also work. So we work at a, 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 a piece of art, whether it be a poem or a painting or a drawing or a sculpture or a play or whatever it is, and it is literally play. But it's also work. And the distinction between the two is pointless and needless and gloriously enables and inspires the child that we're talking about. Now, when I ran the last theatre that I ran, which was in North London, called the Almeida Theatre for 12 years, when I arrived there, well, there was no education department, and so I started one. And I asked my newly uh, appointed head of education to find the six toughest schools in Tower Hamlets, Haringey, um, and Islington. Um, and uh, it was not difficult uh, to find tough, tough schools in those areas. I said, I want you to pick the very toughest. And we're going to go in residence, actually, interestingly, borrowing a phrase. We're going to go in residence with writers and directors, and we're going to work with the young people and invent a small play running about 10 or 15 minutes, entirely devised by them. And we did that. And we had a wonderful day in the Almeida Theatre when all of the schools played their plays to each other. You've never sat in a theatre when the schools were so well behaved mm -hmm. because they all wanted to be frightfully uh, orderly so that the other kids would be orderly when they were performing. Um, it was a very healthy experience. Um, but it was an astonishing thing to watch. And without fail, and Andrea touched on this earlier, Without fail, all those schools said to us, every single kid that was involved in your work improved their work elsewhere. And when we had arrived, we said, watch our lips. We are not here to address your curriculum. We will be working with the young people on themselves. We are not concerned with what preparing those kids for exams. And of course, coincidentally, surprise, surprise, that's precisely what we did. But the wonderful thing to watch was the journey that so many of those young people went on. They gained self-confidence. They gained in self-esteem. They gained a sense of their own identity. And they gained confidence in the way in which they could collaborate and communicate with each other. A preparation, you could argue, for being a citizen of the world. I think the essence which is so different, I think, from so, so other areas in education, of the arts is that they address the individual. They don't address the mass. So what's important in addressing a young person thinking of creating, albeit in whatever form, is to address them as an individual, to encourage out of them what they want to express, what they feel passionate about. They are not a, they are not a type. They are an individual. And of course, art, what's wonderful about art, particularly in the sort of context that Andrea's already shown you, is that it doesn't judge you. It, it's, it doesn't, it, you're accepted, it's yours. There you are, there's my drawing, there's my poem, there's my sculpture. It doesn't judge you, it doesn't ask for answers. It's, a, it's, it's absolutely accepted as being the possession of the person who created it. It's a release. I think even more particularly, what art does, and what I, this is my own phrase, I think what it does is it gives shape to chaos. Let's be honest. Most of our lives, globally and individually, are chaotic. We are inside ourselves chaotic. We're a mixture of yings and yangs and tugs in all kinds of different directions. And I've never seen, in all my 69 years, a globe quite so riven with argument and people shouting across the ravine at each other. So there is a kind of chaos. In fact, there's a particular kind of chaos in this country at the moment. But there is a kind of chaos. And that's one of the healing elements that art has. Because it doesn't just address a global chaos or a social chaos. It addresses the chaos inside here. We are in a time when, thank goodness, now, even this morning, in a society where finally 
the government is waking up to the fact that mental illness amongst young people is a major, major problem. This is not an enlightened moment on behalf of the politicians. It's because all the people who are working in the fields, like yourselves and people in working in mental health, have been shouting at the top of your voices, we need help. And finally, at the end of the day, government has had to listen, and hence this morning's announcement. Probably not enough, but at least it's an advance. So what... When Hamlet asked the question, what a piece of work is a man? I think for the first moment in our history, at the end of the 16th century, a generation of playwrights inspired and led by an absolute genius discovered that the answer to that question is the unity of opposites. We have inside us the yin and the yang of the human personality. So all the plays that preceded Shakespeare, which were all morality plays, in which there was always somebody in white and somebody in black, there was, the, there was, the, there was the, um, an angel and, a de and the devil, everything's very clear. And everything since has explored the infinite shades of grey against absolutes. Oscar Wilde, one of my great heroes, once said that when we, when we, as we often do in rehearsal, we talk about the truth. We've got to find the truth. The truth, pure and simple. And Oscar Wilde said, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. And he's right. And it's that tangle, that irony, that contradiction, that conflicting tension that the arts address. And it applies every bit to a girl who's come from Syria, to a kid in Plough Hamlets, as it does to all of us in this room. What art also does is that it moves that which is private into the public arena. Feelings, not facts. In fact, I would argue that what the arts do is address the side of the national health that we can't see. It addresses that which is invisible. Our emotional, psychological, mental, spiritual selves. Um, those self-portraits that you saw earlier reminded me of one that I, I remember seeing when I was researching a play about sex abuse. And I went to see um, a, a doctor who specialized in it, and he'd got a number of drawings in there uh, of self-portraits by quite young children, just as, you know, an exercise. And there was one in particular, and I, it took me about three or four seconds to notice. She said, do you notice what's strange about this picture? It was drawn by a like, six-year-old who'd suffered terrible abuse. And I looked at it, and it suddenly hit me. She'd given herself no mouth. The portrait of her face had no mouth. I can't speak. I can't utter. I can't articulate that which has gone on. And in a funny way, actually, that's what I thought was so powerful about the Syrian refugee. I, I was going to say, I was too shy to do it, but I was going to say that what was in her bubble is, what's the point of speaking? Because you're not going to understand me, which in a different way was what she was saying. Who is going to listen? The point about communication is it's no good talking in a void. It's no good talking in an empty room. The great thing about art is that it communicates from the private self into the public arena. And it could be you or me or Andrea or classmates or whoever. It's the first step to articulate what's going on in here. It's also, and this is a little tip to Mr. Gove, um, it's also impossible to quantify, to measure. Very, very difficult. And for those who know the price of everything and the value of nothing, another little reference to Oscar Wilde, um, that's worrying, that's troubling. But I think we're faced with a very, very stark choice, ladies and gents. We are either going to breed generations of young people who are creative, positive, released, connected to each other, or, as we're doing with remarkable 
um, freedom at the moment to breed kids who are destructive, stunted, negative, frustrated, bitter, angry, and worst of all, desensitized to the violence around each other. I have an obsession, as you may already have picked up, uh, with that moment in English history 400 years ago. And one of the first people who wrote in blank verse was a playwright called Thomas Kidd. And he once said, where words prevail not, violence prevails. When a kid can't articulate what's inside them, the easiest thing to do is to reach for a knife, is to reach for a gun, is to just wave their fists. I can't express what's going on inside me. And that is lethal. It is a pollutant. Let me give you a little more of an example. Am I all right for time? Please go ahead. Becky, am I all right for time? Okay. Um, I'll give you an example. When we think, all of us here in this room, when we think, we think in words, do we not? So therefore, surely it follows that if we shrink and impoverish the vocabulary inside a child's head, we must be impoverishing their thought. If they can't express themselves, if they don't have the language, and as a director in the theatre, that's what I principally work with, language, if we impoverish that, we surely are bound to be create kids who will fulfill Thomas Kidd's prediction about violence. So, as I say, I think we have a choice. Um, I immediately crossed out a number of statistics that I'd got on my piece of paper because Andrea quoted them beautifully, and I won't repeat them now. But <clears throat> with 92 billion pounds that she mentioned, we are actually the third largest exporter of cultural product in the world. The only two ahead of us are China and America. This tiny island. And it is the fastest growing part of the economy. More than gas and oil and electricity and cars and aerospace put together. And yet, the government doesn't see that, doesn't see that actually the creativity and imagination and decision-making and choices that are made and confidence that comes from it, they don't see how that benefits even their obsession with GDP. But ironically, and I know this when I've gone around trying to raise money from government bodies and corporations and goodness knows what. Of course, British culture is one of the great boasts of, of governments, one of the great boasts of politicians. They can't wait to tell visiting <coughs> delegations how brilliant English culture is, yet do they support it? Do they heck? They don't. And I speak not just about education, I speak from my own world, where the shrinking subsidy for the arts to be accessible to everybody is desperately depressing. I can't tell you how over the 47 years I've worked in the theatre, how, how it's shrunk. It's shrunk and it's shrunk and been eroded in the most awful way. Andrea touched on this. I'm just going to finally expand on this. I think at the moment we're staring at a country, when I talk about choice, in which we have a really virulent form of cultural apartheid. If you were a private school head showing your prospective parents of children that you would want to come to your school round the school, can you imagine a situation having shown you all the tennis courts and swimming pools and beautiful football pitches and all the rest of it going? But however, we don't have anything for the arts. We've got no concert hall, no theatre, uh, no, no art room. So we're not really terribly interested. It's inconceivable. And if it was conceivable, you can be damn sure that the parents wouldn't send their kids to that school. So why is that good enough for a private school and not good enough for a state-run school? Why? And the answer, of course, is money. The answer, of course, is resulting in a kind of apartheid. And it's disgusting. And it's unacceptable. And if anybody believes in the value of the arts as much as I do, then surely to goodness we owe those children that chance to express themselves, to find the empathy, the tolerance,
the, the ability to communicate. I'm going to briefly tell you about one, briefly, underlined. Um, I'm going to briefly tell you about uh, somewhere where, where my wife Karen and I went uh, uh, in last year. We went to a school in Swaziland. Uh, it's called Waterford Cum Laba, and it's one of the United World College schools where a lot of the kids come uh, with, sub with subsidy for, and grants and scholarships from the United World Colleges. And you can apply to go to a UWC school anywhere in the world. But aside from actually giving you subsidy and scholarship, the extraordinary thing that they do is they say, okay, you've been chosen. You live in Oslo, and you've been chosen, and you definitely, this is definitely a, a kid worth investing in, worth helping, who can't actually pay for their own education. But we're going to put you in Swaziland. Or we're going to put you in Australia. Or we're going to put you in the Amer United States of America. Now, of course, the child is not that surprised because it was made clear initially that that was one of the purposes. But it's still quite a shocking and difficult thing to do to a 13-year-old child. But when we went there, we were just short of the 83 different languages that Andrea was talking about in her own school. We were teaching kids from 70 different nation nationalities with 70 different languages. And it was one of the happiest, most delightful, creative, imaginative, fun places I've ever been in my life. I go back there like a shot. And surprise, surprise, what was I there to do? I was there to teach kids from 13 to 18 about Shakespeare. And they said, we don't want you to just do it for the English students. We want you to do it for the physics students and the chemistry students and the math. math, math. I said, are you sure? Yes. Definitely. And the whole school entered into this spirit. And there was no sense, of course, about a, a, an anxiety about difference. And that's why the kids are lifted out of Oslo or Torquay or wherever. To, to, to find a world in which they experience subjectively, firsthand, that the difference of race and creed and color and religion was finally secondary to our common humanity. And it was, as I say, as Karen will, will confirm, an utterly joyous experience. It is possible, and they're all interested in the arts. I leave you finally with one thought. Isn't it interesting that when um, countries are overtaken by tyrants or fundamentalists, that one of the first groups of people they head for to silence or shove in prison are artists. It's not a coincidence, folks. Because the individual, coming back to my starting point, the individual independent voice, the comment, as Andrew was pointing out, on the world, the conscience of the world, often is expressed by artists. I've met Ai Weiwei, and I tell you, what that man has had to put up with in his life is absolutely disgusting. And they carry the weight of the world troubles on their shoulders and they express it openly, freely, bravely, courageously. And therefore it's no surprise whether it's Ai Weiwei or Malala Yousafzai. They're the first people who are going to be shut up. The first people are going to be silenced. The first people are going to be shot in the face because they don't like independent individual voices. And that's what the arts provide ultimately. But all of us, and you know much more about this than I do, all of us in this room have the chance to inspire a new generation of young people in the arts. And I've absolutely not done anything that you asked me to do, which is actually to talk about the experience of being an artist in residence. But I am now, <coughs> you know, wander off the point, typical. Um, but I am actually now uh, currently uh, an artist in residence uh, in East London, in Haringey, um, uh, and I'm bringing my knowledge and expertise as a theatre director to those kids. And I don't walk in the room as a teacher. I walk in as an artist. I walk in as a director. There's no point me pretending to be something that I'm not. But I'm able, hopefully, to inspire those kids. And my, my again, surprise, surprise, my subject um, is Shakespeare, is to inspire those kids that actually Shakespeare is for them in such a way that they understand it practically, not academically, 
from my point of view, it's not an academic study, it's a practical study. I've got to put it on a stage. I've got to enable my actors to make sense of, and, and make these lines live. And to, f to watch 17, 18-year-old children begin to experience the sheer sensual delight of this extraordinary language and to watch them begin to own it is such a privilege. And um, I think this remarkable woman's inspirational idea of artists in residence is truly magnificent, and I feel very, very privileged to be part of it. Thank you very much. Oh, that man, that man, that man is incredible, isn't he? Inspiring. Um, I'm not sure how to follow that, but um, on, my, on my journeys over the last eight months, I have had the privilege of visiting many different countries, and it's quite fascinating because um, the questions and the issues are very similar. And this is what they're saying in different countries. First of all, many teachers are struggling um, trying to integrate this new multicultural world. That's one of the, the topics, the hot topics that are out there. But and for teachers, this is quite interesting for us to be aware of. But can you imagine my response to the second question? So I went to a country in South America, and this is one of the questions they asked me. They said to me, and this was from a teacher, do you think that girls should be educated the same as boys? I always have that. Whenever I say that, I, that people take a breath. But my friends, that's what's happening in the world. So we have got quite a lot that we need to do to work towards saying, oh my God, yes, they deserve that and more. But I think the one thing which I'm so proud, which the, the Varki Foundation are leaders in, and that's promoting the respect for teachers. And that's why I've put this Time Magazine article in the front. I'm not sure if you've seen this, but there was an article, I think it came out in, I think it was in September, whereby um, the Time Magazine, they, they, they advertised, no, they interviewed many teachers in America, teachers who have who've got MAs, have been teaching for many years, and they've found out that they actually teach or, or they do more than one job. So they're, you know, they're seven to five is teaching, and then afterwards they go to work and have another job. And I found that quite amazing, and I could not really believe that until I met a teacher in New York, and I said, is this real? She then sh went to the staff room, and then she opened the locker, and she showed me her uniform. And I said, my God, what's that? She goes to me, I'm a waitress. When I finish from here, I am a waitress. And I, I almost, my heart broke because I don't quite get it. Teachers are the light. And I, I know there's many teachers in this room. And hopefully there's beginner teachers as well in this room. But without you, there's no hope for our children. You're the role models. You're the ones who make sure that they experience something which they don't have, and that's care, that's love, that's consistency, and that's education. And if we don't do this, sometimes I wonder who will, who is out there for them, who will guide them, who will put them on this right track, who will question them, who will give them the answers. And as a result of that, I always get asked some questions, and I think it's quite... <laughs> Um, interesting at this point, this is a picture of my school. Um, we are all slightly balmy like I am. But um, there's some, there's some um, questions that get, that get answered all the time from, my, from the new teachers there, the new qualified teachers. And I just need to point some things out. So first of all, to all the teachers in this room, it's absolutely normal that on a Sunday night you don't sleep. And I know there's many of us in this room who last night we didn't sleep. Um, <laughs> speaking to Becky earlier. But that's normal. Uh, I don't know what it is. Is it excitement to go back to work on Monday? I don't, I'm not sure if it's that or anxiety. But, you know, you'll get used to that. We get excited when Paper Chase have a sale on stationery. <laughs> we do, don't we? We just can't wait for that. Um, and then what we do, we then label everything because it's ours and not the other teachers. Um, we find it um, really oh, fulfilling to be laminating at 8 o'clock at night. We like to laminate. 
And some of the things that um, I always ask is, you know, give me some tips. How can I, you know, how can I improve? And the, the, the few things that I say to them is, um, you know, if, if anyone has told you not to smile before Christmas, then you need to get physical and tell that person where to go because that's wrong. My dear friends, we need to start building relationships in, in our, with our students from the offset. We need to make sure that we create environments that are stimulating, environments that you want to be learning in if you were a student, and environments that you, would, that you enjoy teaching in. But I think the most important thing is to remember that the power of kindness Many of our students, um, we don't know what their backgrounds are, and you are the next best thing to that perfect role model, to the parent figure, and to the person who is kind to them. So please let make, uh, bear that in mind. And the last thing I'd like to say is just thank you to all the teachers out there. Um, it is an extraordinary job, we, and it's a very hard job. I'm standing here in front of you, and I have had awful days being a teacher. I've had days where I've had to rip my hair out. Um, and I think, oh my God, how can I continue? But trust me, those days whereby you, that child gets that equation or that child is able to communicate and says that word to you like, hello, miss. And you're like, oh my God, he speaks. That's his voice. Those, that's the reason why we do what we do. That's the absolute reason, nothing else, just that. And yes, we will get the most amazing amount of, of Christmas cards <laughs> and birthday cards you can ever expect at Christmas. But for some of our children, we are all they have. So just hold on to that when those days are glum, um, when we, sometimes we, we don't see the end of the paperwork, whereby um, the red pen of our marking just seems to be more than their actual student pen. <laughs> so just hold on to that, please. I'm going to leave you with this last um, student piece of work of mine. Now, this student, she came to us from an island um, off of India called Diu. Um, and it's, um, I wouldn't say it's the most developed island in the world. And when our students come to us, this particular student, she's never, she's year eight, so that she was uh, 12 years old. She never attended school at all. So she was at home um, with her parents all the time. And she couldn't communicate, very shy lady, very shy girl. Um, you know, you could sense that from her body language. One day, uh, she came up to me and she brought her friend with her. And, and the friend said to me, Miss, um, let's call her, um, let's call her Rima. Rima, uh, Miss Rima would like to do some work, but she hasn't got the equipment. So I gave her a sheet of paper. Um, I ripped it out from a sketchbook. It was the only thing I had to hand. And I gave her a packet of oil pas pastel materials. Um, in total, that must have been about a pound. And I said, no, this is Rima's. She can have it. I do not want it back. She can have this. And I said to um, her friend there, I said, can you ask Rima just to draw me a picture of somebody in her family, anyone who she wanted? And this is the image that she came back with. Now, I'm going to leave this up there because I think it's, for me, this is, again, one of those moments, those very small golden moments whereby my heart was filled of love and warmth because this child now has had that moment. She can now talk, she can communicate, and she can say, I am good at something, and I'm good at drawing. And by God, is she not good at drawing? Look at that blending. Look at those eyes, they're haunting. What story are they telling us? What's her journey been like? And this student now, She's not yet fluent, as you can imagine. It's only been about, um, it's been about a year. She's not fluent, but she's happy. You know, she skips into our lessons. She makes sure that all the sketchbooks are out, the materials are out before all the other students in. She says, thank you, miss. Have a nice day, miss. She smiles. She is present. She's not a ghost anymore. And she will achieve, and she will fly. And that is the power of the arts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, 
we have time for some questions. Um, oh, hands are already up. Hello, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't hear your name. My name is Joachim. I'm very interested in, the, in a field that, has, that is, for some people, quite popular and for, for others, not so much. It's a, a field called uh, STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, yeah. Arts and Maths. Um, I see it as a great way for artistic-minded students to access different, um, different subjects by basically cross-pollinating their knowledge and, 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 and practice to the fields of, of engineering and technology and maths and science. And for also scientifically-minded students who are often told that they're not creative or think that of themselves to access it as well. And there's a plethora of tools to do that, um, but sometimes teachers are quite uncomfortable with the technological aspects of, of things or don't have the means. Maybe it's a quite a broad question, but I'd love to, to know what is your take on, on, on the idea of STEAM? Do you think that okay. it, in practice it works quite well? Or? Well, Leonardo da Vinci, the greatest artist, the greatest scientist. I think we must not put our students in boxes and say, you're good at that, you're good at that. We must value every single subject and give them the opportunity to experience every single subject. Um, I read an article recently that some surgeons, they were finding that the, um, the, the, the junior doctors they were teaching, they were lacking motor skills because they weren't spending a lot of time drawing or practicing and, and the care of holding equipment, the care of maybe chiseling or, or um, cutting a piece of wood in DT. I mean, this is what we need to make sure that we're encouraging our students to do. So I believe that every student subject is just as important as all the others. I hope that helps. Hello? Um, I think that's quite, in terms of subjects, well, we know that the drama departments are, are suffering quite a lot. We know that music departments are, are suffering quite a lot. I know that it's quite difficult to recruit music teachers um, as well as DT teachers. I think it's all, all the areas of the arts we need to pay particular attention to. Um, I, I can't value. I don't think they're not important. I think it's mindsets, to be honest with you. I think there's a mindset that the arts are not as important as other subjects and that students do not need the, the arts, particularly if they want to be successful in careers. I think it's changing the mindsets. And the art world is so keen in proving this that actually it's, that's not the case. Um, so it's once we change the mindsets... Um, and get rid of the e-back, then, <laughs> then, we, then we can really move things along. Um, and we'll, we will get there. I'm determined we're going to get there. Hello. My name is Naveen. Hi, I'm Naveen. I'm as well. <laughs> and um, if you could change the curriculum for, for um, art, not like drama or other arts, just mainly like sketching, drawing, what percentage of the curriculum would you give focus to like art history or the history of art in terms of the knowledge aspect of it um like what ratio would be based upon learning knowledge yeah. and the other ratio about how to actually sketch and draw and paint you see the most fascinating thing is that the national curriculum for art is perfect there's only two paragraphs in it it's perfect. We have got flexibility. We have got so much freedom to explore, and I love that about the curriculum. Um, I think what we need to do is just have the time, um, the confidence, and the skills to make sure that we are delivering all the different aspects. So photography, um, fine art, drawing, um, ceramics, in all our lessons. But again, that's a lot of money, um, and it's trying to make sure we get that so that all our students can experience that. Can I do a follow-up? Can I quickly just ask also? Um, go on, Naveen. Go but on. Then You've got the mic. Go for it. I love the fact that you want to really focus on the physical aspects of art. Um, but I feel like there's so much knowledge yes, yes, that yes. is not prioritised unless you go to a private school or unless you 
have parents who are like a big fan of the arts. A lot of the history of it, for example, like going to a museum, and if you don't know the history of art generally, you are limited in how much you can appreciate what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, it's just what I was wanting to think. If you no, no, you're right. No, you're that. absolutely right. And ideally, a really good scheme of learning should have the historical context incorporated with the teaching of the art as well. There's got to be. It's, it's got to marry up. Because if you don't know, learn from the history, then how can you um, appreciate what's been done and how you'd like to move things forward? Hello, sir. My name's Paul Hudson. I've never taught, actually, in a uh, school. I'm a bit of an interloper. Anyway, first of all, congratulations on your, pri on your prize, and I very much enjoyed your talk. Thank you, Paul. Um, I wanted to make a comment and a question. The comment was, um, I attended a meeting about four months ago and the Astronomer Royal, who is also President of the Royal Society, he was advocating STEAM, i.e. the sciences, technology, and, and including the arts, basically, not just on science. Now, that connects with the question I want to ask. I don't know what has gone wrong, but one of the things that strikes me that's been going wrong for the last few years perhaps it's to do with our ministers of education for the most part. But education is not about education, about getting people to think. It's about training them to be cogs to fit into the industrial machine. This is training. It's, it's a nuts and bolts, purely a functional approach, but I don't know where, what went wrong. Yeah. Certainly when I was at school, yeah. I know that's nearly 100 years ago, um, not There's no idea of a career behind what you're actually uh, learning, none whatever. But this has become really functional, nuts and bolts approach now. It's not an education system we have anymore, possibly mm. except in the public schools. Yes, no, there's many, there's many debates about what, whether or not it's we're fit, really what's taking place in terms of education now, what we're delivering is fit for purpose. But no, I'm not sure how to answer that, but I do agree. It's, a, it's an interesting question to be um, reflecting on. Um, I think we often forget what the word education actually means. The word education comes from the Latin educo. You can see I went to a public school. And um, it, that means to lead out. And the kind of education you've just described, of course, is absolutely the opposite. It's what we stuff in. Now, of course, kids need information, knowledge, talent, ability but they also need to be able to use that to express what's inside. And that's what we're losing sight of. We're losing sight of the essence of what education is about, and it's impoverishing our nation, in my humble opinion. This lovely lady here. Thank you. Um, you know, you talked about... Um, children seeing examples of artists and residents. You, you gave examples of your students who had special, need, special educational needs. The artists and residents that work with you, do they reflect those children? So do you have established artists who come from a variety of backgrounds or who themselves have got needs, um, special needs, so that those children can see. Do you know, I've, ne I've never asked my artists whether you have special educational needs. I don't think that's, that's something that I would like to. I mean, at the end of the day, their, their work speaks for themselves. But in terms of ethnicity, definitely. I, again, it's about the role models there. Um, and, I, and I do see it, how they, in, they can connect with people who they would like to connect with. Um, and it works. It, it is working. But um, ideally, the more diverse we have of, of artists going into schools, the, the more inspiration our students will have. And did that? Did you notice that across the world as you travelled as well? Did oh, I'm not sure. I wasn't looking for the artists across the world, but definitely. I mean, in terms of my school, um, if you have a look at our staff cohort is extremely diverse and especially for our for our girls who follow Islam having a female scientist wearing a hijab that's so powerful that's iconic and and they just feel that miss I can achieve too and we've got to be very mindful of that as well as who we're putting in front of them as their role models Ertha 
Thank you. Um, you talked about art in schools and education for me is important, not just in schools, but what they do outside of school. Mm. So for me, how do you think that we can connect communities and outside of school learning to what's happening in schools? So what key thing would you say that we need to look for for outside school learning for arts to be as important as it is inside of school? I think, I think it really helps when you have um, a school community that opens its doors quite a lot and celebrates what's just out there. Um, there's so much ha happening outside our doors. Our, our, our families and our communities are always involved in something on a Saturdays or on a Sunday, so it's just making sure that we know about that. And the way to know about that is by listening to our students. What is it you do over the weekend? Where do you go? Oh, right, and making those connections. But I think, um, you know, schools are really busy places. Uh, we, we, you know, if you're teaching in school, we, we don't stop. We, some of us forget to, you know, have a cup of tea or sit down. We don't stop. Um, but there must be opportunities of finding out what we can do and how we can incorporate our community in our schools. Very important. Hello, sir. Last one? Is that, is that okay? Okay, sorry. I'm so sorry. But thank you. Thanks, Beth. Thank you. Andrew and Michael, you've certainly given us uh, a lot of food for thought and you've really communicated your passion both for arts, for arts education, and of course for teachers and teaching. Um, thank you for that. It's given us a huge amount of stimulating discussion, and I hope that you'll join us uh, for some refreshments to do that. So before we just move to have a drink and a good conversation, please join me, colleagues, in thanking Andrea and Michael. Thank you.